The synoptic problem takes its name from the fact that you've got three Gospels that look very, very similar to one another, Matthew, Mark and Luke. But the fourth Gospel, John, looks really, really different. And the joy of the synoptic problem is saying, why are those three so similar? Why do they have the same order? Why do they often have the same wording? And can we find a good explanation for that? And it's important, I think, because if you get to see how the synoptic gospels are relating to one another, you come to realize that there's always been a conversation going on about who Jesus is, what he did, and what his impact was. And this is a conversation that's already going on within the pages of the New Testament. It's not something which happens hundreds of years later, it's there right from the very beginning. The solution that I've argued for to the synoptic problem is called the Farrer theory. It's named after Austin Farrer, who was a British theologian and philosopher who wrote an article in 1955 called On Dispensing with Q. And his idea was that if you can draw a direct line from Matthew to Luke, so Luke is using Matthew, then you don't have to suggest that Matthew and Luke were both independently using a source which has got lost, which is Q. I mean, Q is simply the first letter of the German word Quelle, which means source. And the Q theory is, is basically argues, well, look, Matthew and Luke are so similar to one another in lots of passages, and they're similar to each other in these passages that they don't get from Mark's gospel. Because most people, the vast majority of scholars, think that Mark was the first gospel and that Matthew and Luke used it. There's consensus on that. Where the consensus breaks down is over whether Matthew and Luke were looking at Mark independently of one another, in which case they, you have to have a cue as well, or whether one of them had direct contact with the other. And I've argued, following Austin Farrer and following other scholars like Michael Golder, that you can understand the relations between the synoptics best if you argue that Luke directly knew and used Matthew's gospel. One of the reasons why I'm so convinced that Luke had a copy of Matthew's gospel is that when you look at the passages that are, that are only in Matthew and Luke, in other words, passages that aren't in Mark 2, they're really phenomenally close in their wording. Sometimes they'll copy out whole sentences verbatim in Greek. This means that it certainly can't be like an oral tradition kind of source, because to get that kind of close literary agreement in Greek, it means that you must have had one directly using the other. And I say that the agreement is so close that it's, I like to say, it's too good to be Q. It's basically impossible to think that they both coincide so often in the way that they copy out the Q material. So for me, Luke has direct access to Matthew's gospel. Also, you find that Matthew's redactional fingerprints are found all over Luke's gospel. So in other words, when you read through Luke, you keep finding that he has little characteristic, distinctive phrases, rhythm, imagery that we know from Matthew's gospel. I'll give you an example. In Matthew 3 and Luke 3, we have the preaching of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, brood of vipers, who warned you to escape from the coming wrath? Now, it's verbatim the same in Matthew and Luke, but the fun thing is that that is the kind of thing that you get a lot in Matthew's gospel. Offensive, vocative, brood of vipers, and then a rhetorical question, who warned you to escape from the coming wrath? And in fact, you get that exact same phrase, you brood of vipers, twice again in Matthew's gospel, but just here in Luke. And that pattern repeats all the way through Matthew and Luke, so that it looks far more likely, if there is direct contact between Matthew and Luke, as I think there is, that it's from Luke copying Matthew and not the reverse. The, the, the problem, of course, with this is that lots of people say, well, if Luke used Matthew, then why didn't he use Matthew more than he apparently does? So you have these birth narratives in both Gospels, and some people say, that it's impossible that Luke could have missed out all of these bits and pieces from Matthew's birth narrative, like the visit of the Magi and this kind of thing. But I don't think that's a particularly impressive argument. Luke is doing his own thing in the birth narrative, and I think he got the very idea of writing a birth narrative from seeing it in Matthew's gospel. It's not that obvious a thing to do. One of the reasons that I think Luke knew Matthew's gospel isn't just because they have a lot of shared material that's not found in Mark, 
It's also that sometimes when Matthew and Luke are copying Mark, they coincide in the changes that they make to Mark, which is really difficult to explain if they only know Mark and not Luke also knowing Matthew. So quite often when Luke is editing a story from Mark, some Matthean wording comes in. The example is in, in the feeding of the 5,000, Matthew adds, the crowds were following him. Now you might think it's a really minor addition, but that's a very characteristic thing for Matthew to say five more times in the gospel. He has exactly that same expression, the crowds were following him. And it never comes in Mark, and it comes only here in Luke's gospel. Could be a coincidence, but then when you start multiplying all these kind of coincidences, and when you keep seeing this Matthean language cropping up in Luke, you have to say it's much more likely that Luke knows Matthew's gospel. And then you have even things like agreements in the passion narrative where no proponent of Q these days, I don't think, most, no proponent of Q these days says that Q has got a passion narrative. And when therefore you see Matthew and Luke agreeing closely in the passion narrative, you've got to say, well, if this isn't Q, how come they, they've, they've got these agreements? There's, there's, a, there's a famous one in Mark 14, 65, where people blindfold Jesus and they say to him in Mark's gospel, prophesy. But then Matthew and Luke both have the same five words verbatim in Greek. Who is the one who hit you? Who smote you? And it's really, really strange that they would both insert exactly the same phrase at exactly the same point if one didn't know the other. And as I think it, it's if Luke didn't know Matthew's gospel. So all in all, I think the evidence is pretty strong that Luke knew Matthew and it's one of those views that began as a real fringe theory when Austin Farrow proposed it in 1955. It was regarded as kind of maverick out on the edges of, of, the, of the field. But as the years have gone on, people have begun to say, well, hold on a minute. Do we really need Q? Do we really need Q? I mean, it looks so plausible that Matthew's just getting so much, not just of his direct material, like the actual wording from Matthew, but he's also getting the whole idea of revising Mark from Matthew. I, I think what happened is Luke's known Mark for a few years, and then he comes upon a copy of Matthew's gospel, and he can see instantly what it is. It's, a, it's like a fresh version of Mark's gospel with loads of added stuff. So Luke thinks, Luke thinks, I could do that. I could write my own gospel. I could adapt Mark as well. And what's more, not only could I do a similar thing to Matthew, I think Luke thinks he can do it better, and what's more, he can do it better because he can pull in some of the new Matthean material. He, he wants to use some of the new material. Like you have this huge Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7. Luke thinks, OK, we can use that. It's so long and sprawling, Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, that Luke quite reasonably cuts it down. It's about you know less than a third of the length in, in Luke's gospel. So that's really what I think Luke's doing. He finds his copy of Matthew, thinks I can fix Mark 2, but I can fix Mark better and I can use some of the material from Matthew.